I'm Krista Reiser and this is my husband Jay and our SARE grant was about developing a mob grazing system, system to improve the sustainability and profitability of a cattle operation in North Dakota and today we're just going to give you some tips and tricks on electric fencing, um, watching animal performance, uh, what we learned on our rangeland and just we learned a lot from this project so we uh, hope to share some of that with you. A little bit of information about us, we're located in central North Dakota by Washburn and our ranch is just east of there and we run uh, about 150 cow-calf pairs and anywhere from 150 to 300 custom grazing cattle so that keeps us plenty busy. This is the layout of our ranch. Uh, there's not a lot of cross fences. Um, you can see like right here is about a section to just kind of give you some scale. We got a gravel pit road that runs through. We have a creek. We have railroad tracks. Um, so that's just the layout of our main ranch. During our project, the weather was um, different every year. In 2011, it rained a lot. We had a lot of flooding going on. And in 2012, it was really dry during our project. So it gave us mixed results in our grass and production clippings. And then why did we even look into mob grazing? Uh, there was degraded rangeland everywhere we looked. We were just getting started on this ranch. And it had been selectively grazed at a low stock density. So as starting out, we had continuous economic and ecological deterioration, and we knew we really needed to do something different if we were going to ranch on this property. Uh, a few things we learned before we started mob grazing. We learned that we needed to focus on our animals' performance, and also we were told we needed to increase our density before our stocking rate. So uh, mob grazing, you hear that word thrown a uh, around a lot. Uh, that It just kind of depends on your stock density, which depends on your production. Uh, you also hear high stock density grazing. There's a probably a few other terms out there. We just say mob grazing because it's easy for us to say. Uh, a few terms that we use. We do everything in cow days per acre um, when we're doing our grazing because we couldn't visually see how much it took a cow to eat in a month, you know, how much they needed. And we were doing things on hours and it was just a lot easier to visualize what that cow needed in one day. Uh, the classes of cattle that we used in mob grazing, we did pairs with calves that were greater than a month old. We also did fall calving cows and we did no mob grazing while we were calving just because we didn't want to have those type of densities in case there might be mothering issues. A misconception when we talk to a lot of people, um, they always think that mob grazing is about eating everything and leaving nothing behind and that's not at all what we were trying to do. We were trying to get a certain trample to graze ratio um, in order to get our soil covered. Just a few more terms that were really important for us. The stocking rate versus stock density. So stocking rate is the number of acres needed to support one animal for the time you expect the herd to remain in the cell. And it also depends on plant production and the size of the grazing animal. Where stock density was the concentration of the animals in that cell. So this is what the ranch was like before we started. It was low stock density, they were spread out everywhere. We had overgrazing, undergrazing, and poor nutrient distribution. We could have thrown a few cells in there to get better even grazing and you know, more manure and urine distribution, but we knew we needed to take it uh, one step further on our ranch. So we went to higher stock density, so we'd have more even grazing, more competitiveness between the animals, um, hoof action by the animal impact, and we hope to improve the soil health. Uh, this is a picture we took up in Canada. You know, a lot of people think of mob grazing, you know, of having this many cattle in an area, and just due to our production, we were not able to get to this point. Um, but the, this person was moving every half hour where we only were able to move four times a day. Is that my, yours? <laughs> We got to switch. Yeah. Excuse us, we got to switch the mic around. So. That doesn't want to go on. All right. 
The two main conclusions uh, while we were doing our project that uh, became very apparent to us is that first of all that mob grazing um, in our area should be used more as a tool than as a whole ranch grazing system and it wasn't physically the grazing that gave us our results it was the rest that we were able to incorporate into our system that made us successful. Uh, we used many different tools as we were getting going on this. We found out we needed to make sure we had good equipment. Um, we were doing things uh, very intensively, so we needed to make sure that uh, things were working well for us. Uh, this is some of our temporary water tanks that we used um, with, with setting up so that we would have cows in a, in a cell that would be broken down further. Uh, we didn't have in, them in there longer than seven days and so we needed to be moving water to there because we just didn't have enough naturally occurring water. Uh, to move these, we would drain them, pull them up on a, on a flatbed trailer, move them on to the next area. Um, one thing we did find out is that with our calves, uh, due to the water being drank down, we didn't have as good of a recharge rate on our well as we would have needed. The calves got pushed out of the way, they couldn't reach the water. We were able to get this uh, creep water tank and uh, that solved that problem so that the calves were able to drink and weren't shoved out of the way. Uh, we tried to use simple fencing materials since we were covering large, uh, pretty large area of land, uh, moving things quite often. Uh, as you can see on our four-wheeler on the back, we have uh, geared rollers uh, full of uh, quarter-mile poly braid. Um, we've got two different types of electric fence posts. Uh, both of them we use for uh, the reason that they are easy to transport, easy to set up, easy to take down, and very lightweight. Uh, we used uh, some jump wires. We used a lot of just square bale twine, and I'll show that coming up, and then our bat latches, which helped us uh, move as often as we did. As you can notice on all these things, we didn't use any T-posts. Uh, they're heavy, they're bulky, and for us, we just didn't think they were going to work as well. Um, here's a picture since we didn't use T-posts on any of our corners. This is how we built our corners into our temporary cells. Uh, we would use the twine string, uh, which I made a hoop up at this end, um, and then ran that through the eyelet of the pigtail posts and down to another pigtail post. And it made kind of a modified H-brace is uh, where the idea kind of came from. Here's a little bit closer, closer up. You can see the hoop that I made. Um, in that end and then once again just running it down. Uh, this was a situation we needed to water out of one particular water point and we had two cells servicing it. So uh, you can get pretty ingenuitive. Um, the biggest drawback that we had is, as far as our fencing was um, our mind. Where do you, where do you get your uh, fencing wire, your, your spools and stuff? Um, these ones I all got through PowerFlex Fence. Um, I have gone now to getting things from uh, Kenco Fence, I believe was the last place we had got it because uh, PowerFlex, I don't think their materials are as high of quality as they used to be. Um, this is how, when we did our longer runs, um, this is how we'd end one uh, geared reel and start another. We'd just do a, a, double, a double of the same thing on that. And I, I try not to exaggerate when I say we use a lot of twine string, but um, it was, it's easy to carry, easy to transport. With everything we did, it's all single wire electric fence. Uh, once again, from the portability standpoint and the ease of use, uh, we used, as you can probably see, we had the four-wheeler for a lot of different things, but we also used it as, to some extent, a acting part of the fence because when we would get in areas where there was very tall forage, where the forage would be physically higher than the wire of the fence, uh, in visiting with um, some other people, we found out we needed to make a way that the cows would know the fence is coming. So I would drive around the inside of the poly wire so when, and uh, effectively it trained the cows to when they'd see the tracks, they would... Um, know that the fence was just on the other side of it. So with, uh, with everything being temporary and uh, portable, we had to do the same thing with our energizers and also with using the poly braid wire um, or the temporary wire, it, ten it tends to have a higher resistance level. So we had to make sure our energizer was strong enough. I use a rule of thumb of half to one joule per mile of electric fence that I put up when I use entirely temporary electric. Um, sometimes I go higher than that, especially training cattle. Um, we, everything was battery powered. We do have solar panels in certain area or with certain energizers to recharge them. 
And then also my ground rods. I use a four foot ground rod with just a cable clamp on the top of it. And then I'm able to just grab that, pull it out of the ground, throw it on the four wheeler, move to the next area. Uh, here's a picture of the bat latch. This was uh, one of the things that made things uh, very, made it capable for us to be able to move as often as we did. Uh, more or less a bat latch. The easiest way to explain it is it's a solar powered alarm clock. And instead of, um, and then when it, you set the time that you want the gate to open, there's a little finger in the bat latch that will move to allow this spring gate to shoot open. Uh, here you can see a little bit better how the entire system is set up. Um, and then we used a, a fiberglass electric fence post to uh, be able to support the weight of the pull on the poly wire going the opposite direction. Uh, here's a picture of after the cows have moved through into the new cell, how everything looks as it's open. And we would move the cows four times a day using, using three bat latches. Here's a picture. You saw earlier the picture of our land base. And, uh, oh. Yep, the, the, oh, yeah. oh, the sorry, the question was uh, what happens with the gate handle after I do that? Um, and that, let's see here, yeah, that uh, the wire just, the spring gate just lays on the ground there. Um, with a strong enough energizer, it's not a problem. Uh, I did, after a certain amount of time, the cows wouldn't even test the fence anymore, so I didn't even electrify the gate at, from that point in time, so then I wasn't losing any voltage through the ground. So. Um, and then, like I, on the, earlier on where Krista showed the layout of the land, this is what we ended up doing with our temporary electric fence. Um, we would make, make cells and lanes something like this. And I'm going to focus on those uh, particular ones up there. That was an area that we mob grazed as part of this project. Uh, here's where the longer layout of the cells are. And here's what happens when we mob grazed it. Uh, we would put cells in to be able to move the cattle anywhere from once to four times a day in there, uh, depending on the production and what we needed to do. Um, we found with our cell size, uh, how you lay out the cells can have a big impact on your trample to graze ratio and therefore affecting the goals that you have for a particular piece of land. Um, here's one way where you can have a long, narrow cell where you open up the entire fence and have the cows move into the next cell. When they do move in that way, the cows are moving in kind of a wide line and they just, they spend more time eating. Um, so you're going to have a higher graze and a lower trample. And then you just continue on down there. With us uh, doing the bat latches and having a gate in there, we effectively changed the direction of those cells and now they're long and narrow cells. And now those cows move in there and they graze back and forth. They're a little bit more competitive and they're going to trample more grass than they eat on a percentage basis. So once again, it comes back to your land management uh, goals for a particular piece. And on some of these cells, those individual cells are one acre or less. So we could change it as we went. Um, when we were training the cattle, uh, to mob grazing, the first thing was training them to electric fence. We did some of this with custom grazing cattle that had never seen electric fence. Uh, the, the electric fence training was, was kind of the first part anyway. And then training for the mob grazing, it, was, it took about a week. And the biggest thing was training them to go around the corner because you'd have a group of cows that would be heading in this direction and the other group of cows would be going this way to get to the gate and the tail enders would be, just be all kind of confused. So that made things frustrating from time to time, but really moving the cattle, they would learn that, uh, uh, they'd learn what the bat latch sounded like, they'd learn that when I came out there it was time to move and they were ready to go. Uh, the typical day while we were doing the mob grazing for setting up for four cells, I'd go out there and first of all take down the previous day's fences, I would, I would uh, set up the first cell for the day, I'd let the cows into that cell, and then I'd go set up the rest of the other three moves for the day, setting up the bat latches. I'd come back, double check my bat latches, and then go about whatever else I needed to get done for the day. Uh, as we were planning to set this up, as you saw on the previous slide, we had lots of fences going every which in different sort of direction. Uh, we did use a lot of uh, different 
types of situations to set up those fences and to plan for them. Uh, the main thing was just a printed out map um, that I'd, I'd sketch on and try and um, try and take a rough idea where I wanted. I could come inside. I used a North Dakota Water Commission has a good uh, GIS um, usable map that you can get at and then I could actually figure out how many acres were on each uh, particular paddock that I was doing. Then when I'd go out there I'd use the four-wheeler odometer to measure the distance as I was setting up my fence um, and then I'd also use my own personal strides. I'd, need, I'd say okay today I'm going to move four times I need a total of four acres for this group of cows each cell needs to be an acre wide. I figured out that my uh, my larger cell was so many feet wide and then I'd figure out number of strides to get to one acre. Um, when determining the right amount of forage for for the day and for each move for that instance that takes a it takes kind of a trained eye and I'm not going to stand in front of you and say that I have a trained eye yet. Um, it's it's not the easiest thing to do. The biggest thing is just watch the animals. Um, are they content when you're out there? Are they bellering? Do they, do they look restless? They'll tell you when they need to move um, if it's an actual nutritional issue with them. Um, then also is the animal impact goal that you have for a piece of ground met? And all these, of course, definitely go back to the grass quality and the grass quantity. Um, when I would be out there, I knew how many cell or how many moves I needed to do for the day or wanted to do for the day. Uh, determining when I wanted to make my next move, a lot of this was based off of bricks. We know that the bricks are higher in the grass in the afternoon, so I would try and do, or we would try and do more moves in the afternoon. Um, and potentially larger cells and less moves in the morning. Uh, we did find though with hot temperatures that kind of threw everything for a loop because the cows would, instead of finding the bat latch at two in the afternoon and then four in the afternoon, they might go stand by the water at noon and not go back out to graze till six. So that kind of just shot everything that you worked so hard for. So when we had really hot weather, we found that we had to change things up and start moving cattle in the morning and in the evening following when they would naturally graze. Uh, we also paid attention to the manure composition to make sure that our, uh, to try and guess and make sure that our protein to, to energy ratio was correct. And the biggest thing I used was gut fill. And I'm going to use a couple of slides to explain this. Um, if you can see a little bit, it doesn't show up the best on the screen here. Um, to find, to look at gut fill on the cow, you're going to be looking at the left side of the cow behind the rib and in front of the hip. And on this particular cow, you can see she's sunk in right here. That is very un, uh, unsatisfactory gut fill. Uh, the reason she looks like this is we had just worked those cows. They'd been standing in a corral for eight hours before they got turned out. Um, I did not ever want an animal to, to look like this while we were mob grazing. This is what I wanted. You can see right there that she is very full. Her rumen is completely filled to capacity, um, and she really is kind of at a point where she can't eat much anymore just due to the uh, capacity to fill that. Um, this one's a little tougher to see again. This is more what we'd be seeing on a daily basis that we were watching for. Uh, the gut fill on her is, is indicating to me that we need to move those animals on, get them some new grass, uh, get that intake picked up. Uh, here's a cow that's going to be the same cow in three pictures to kind of show a progression of gut fill. Uh, with this one, she could be moved on to a, a new cell. She's a little sunk in. You can tell her rumen isn't as full. Uh, this one is kind of, is probably what we were seeing most of the time um, when we were grazing is about this. And then this is what we wanted to see. Um, she's a lot fuller. Um, her rumen is, is completely full up. She's going to be she's going to be at her maximum intake, which was a, was a goal. Uh, we also look at manure composition uh, to make sure we have the protein to energy ratio correct. Uh, we all have seen spring, what manure and cattle look like off a of spring washy grass. Uh, one thing we have used is use a straw bale to get that, uh, to get that uh, dry matter that they're ingesting, uh, balance that out a little bit. One uh, kind of trick that we did notice was that um, a way to a way to just look out at your grass and kind of know where you're setting. A brown grass has more energy in it. Uh, that's why it burns very well. 
where very green lush grass has more protein in it as a comparison and that's why uh, it doesn't necessarily burn as well. Um, uh, here's a, we, we kind of scoured to find some manure pictures. We didn't find very many so I do apologize about this one but this would be a, a manure patty that I would look at and say that animal is not getting enough protein in her diet. Uh, the manure you can see is kind of stacking up a little bit. Um, the closest thing we found is the same thing that a feedlot looks for when they look at manure. You want a pumpkin pie consistency manure pie uh, when you're doing that. Um, you don't want it too runny, but you don't need it. You don't want it stacking up like this either. Now we got to switch again. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to run through a few slides of the mob moving. Here the bat latch had just opened up and the cattle are going into the next cell and they all have their heads down and they're just grazing, um, going for the new grass and they're very competitive, um, you know, searching out the best food and they're wondering what their neighbor's eating. So if you have any weed issues, you don't really need to worry about it, but uh, they clean everything up pretty well. and. Um, Oh, sorry, I thought we were going to a different slide. But however, um, the forage, it tramples uh, really differently. We have a lot of Kentucky bluegrass on our place. Um, it trampled different than the smooth brome and the quack grass. So whenever we were moving, we had to pay attention to what species we were grazing on. Also, we learned that wet forage versus dry forage trampled differently. And then also, even in the morning, if there was a really heavy dew versus a drier afternoon, our grass plants just, the cattle wouldn't trample them the same. And then, like I said, the changes in topography, it was, you know, you go up on a hill and then you're down in a low area and just the species um, really affected how the forage trampled. So this was taken when the cows were, right before the, those cows were moving into the cell. And this is what it looked like before the cattle came in there. This is just some quack grass. And after the cattle were in there, you can see that forage is just trampled to the ground. It's feeding the soil biology. It's retaining moisture. And this is what we were going for because we had a lot of bare ground on our pasture. Just a zoomed out version of what it looked like after the cattle got out of there. This is a trample on a thin hillside. It's kind of difficult to see, but we had to move fairly quick across these areas because there's not a lot of forage there for the cattle. And we just wanted to get even manure and urine distribution on these areas. And then you go down the hill and here you'd be in uh, Kentucky bluegrass flat. And the Kentucky bluegrass was just really springy and it was hard to get it trampled into the ground. Um, this was, I believe, in like June. And this was later in the year when it had dried out some. And here you can see the cattle trampled it differently. Uh, you can see that the Kentucky bluegrass ac you know, actually broke down, turned brown, and was in contact with the soil. And a big thing in this grant for us was the rest that it was able to add to our system. So this is a before our mob grazing. And this is an after picture. And this is just one year later. And so you can see that we have a lot more forage growing now. This is another before picture. All we have is rocks and cow pies and an after picture. And you know, it was really easy because we did nothing. We just let it rest. And rest really was like our number one advantage in this project. Even on a small scale, moving our cattle uh, every week, every day. And you can see on this slide, the right side of the screen is greener than the left, and the cows had just moved off the left side. So in one week, our plants were already starting to recover and put nutrients um, into their roots and just grow healthier. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, even on a longer term scale, this was taken last spring, and the right side was grazed in 2013 with 2014 regrowth. And you can just see that line where we had our temporary fence and the west side was rested. And you can just see the difference. And you know, coming out and grazing in the spring, the cattle will have a better balanced diet on the left side because it won't be all washy grass and we wouldn't have to supply that straw. And then here's another, um, on the left side of the screen, it was grazed for two years in a row 
in the middle, it was rested for one year and grazed. And then on the far right, kind of by Jay's head, it was rested for two years. And you can just see the difference that resting makes. Also, from being able to rest some areas, uh, we had areas that were completely 100% uh, blue grama. And now we have new western wheatgrass coming in. You know, we can't say if this is directly from the mob grazing, because we did run the mob across there. But we think it's more the rest in the system. It finally allowed these plants to express themselves. What'd you Doug's see? got a question. Oh. What did you see in the parts that you rested two years? OK, the question was, what did we see on the parts we rested for two years? A lot more forage. I mean, it was previously it had never been rested, so it just finally gave those plants time to fully recover. And now, when we do graze across them, they come back a lot quicker. They're just healthier because they're able to build some root reserves. Huh? Bigger. Yeah, more vigor in the plants. So, um, with the mob grazing, we really had to know our production for every hour the cows were grazing. So it was training the eyes for cow days per acre. We started out by doing some clippings, trying to figure out how much grass is out there. And those were kind of inconclusive, like from one year to the next, but they helped us like during the year knowing how much grass is there. And then also how many hours of grazing. And like Jay talked about, it's really difficult to train your eyes um, to learn this. I don't know if you can tell, but we have quite a bit of bare ground there's just like dandelions, not a whole lot growing there. So this was a big concern for us and why we looked at mob grazing. And so I did some 10 point frame readings. And what I did is I looked directly at the ground at the, or at the base of the pin. And before we mob grazed, we had 18.8% um, to bare ground. So that ground's not growing any forage for our cattle. And then our litter was around 33%. And we had this weird moss, I'm not sure what it was. It wasn't club moss, but the cows weren't going to eat it. And then also, then one year after we mob grazed, we went down to 2% bare ground. So we got that goal of getting the ground covered. Um, our litter went up to 50%. The moss was also reduced. And in that second year, uh, we had still a lot of dandelion and curly cup gumweed. That was pretty much, with grass, the only forbs we had. But by year three, our forbs, um, they had gone down, but they were native forbs. We were no longer having the curly cup gumweed. Also, um, our bare ground, you know, we still had reduced the bare ground. And so we were just, we felt like we were moving in the right direction for our ranch. And we often get asked, did the grass production increase? Well, yes, we're growing more grass, but we're not grazing more cows yet because we're um, trying to make sure we're feeding the soil biology, so we're not harvesting that grass for our cattle. Some frustrations and learning curves we had during, during this, and you can see it's a full slide. Um, cows not finding the bat latch when it opens. I mean, you spend a lot of time getting it all set up, or the bat latch doesn't open. It does occur every once in a while. Um, once we got a quarter mile from water, the even with the mob grazing, our utilization decreased with the cows. The occasional time constraints and other emergencies, pretty much life happens, and then you're out there in a the dark with a flashlight on your head trying to take down fence, and it's just not a lot of fun. And then, like Jay said, standing by water on hot days and not grazing, you know, we didn't realize that, and it took us a while to figure out how to fix it. Determining the right amount of daily forage is just such a headache. You're like, okay, I think the cows need this much, and you move them in there, and you're like, oh, that was way too much. And then you make it a little smaller, and you're like, oh, that wasn't enough. And then it's just, it's hard to get it just right. <laughs> so um, inconsistent stands of forage due to topography with us grazing on native rangeland and all the different types of soils. It was never like, give them so many acres, this is exactly what they need, where if we would have been grazing a brome field, expired CRP, I think the production would have been a lot more even and we could have been more consistent in our cell size. Uh, dumb calves, they're, they're a frustration when they don't find the gate either. Uh, getting eaten by mosquitoes, gnats, and horseflies is just 
the bugs bother you. <laughs> so um, too much rain caused by pugging of soils. And this was mainly, it would happen when we always watched the weather like as close as possible because we didn't want our cattle in a small area when there was going to be a rainstorm because we knew they could do more damage than good. And you know, it's not much fun to come out in the morning and find, you know, that everything's just tilled up. And so that, that was frustrating when you get a random thunderstorm. But with these areas, we knew we just need to rest them for a long time and they do heal back. Um, how did those areas that got trampled out in the thunderstorm, how did they compare to the next uh, over that you did like in the next year? OK, the question was, how do the areas compare um, from where it got they trampled it in the thunderstorm compared to like across the fence where they didn't. They did, they did recover. We're still giving them some rest. You can tell at this time because it's only been a few years, and we got a. But for the most part, they're recovering just fine. I, I don't know if there's much more I could add. Was there another question? So how did the, what did you do to handle the mosquitoes and the flies on the cattle? We w okay. The question was how we handle the mosquitoes and the flies with the cattle. We will actually be getting to that in a couple slides. So, um, so these are the results that we concluded just based off of visual observations. The rest that was incorporated with mob grazing allowed our plants to increase in vigor and production. Mob grazing allowed us to rest an area for an entire year. The different types of grasses and forbs were able to better complement each other and form a fuller canopy so we were collecting more solar energy. Also the warm season plants were better able to express themselves since they were able to mature and go to seed on certain areas of our land base and we did significantly lengthen our grazing season which was the goal, part of the goal in our grant. So this is winter 2012 and we had this stockpiled forage because we were able to mob graze and let this grow and we were able to winter graze on this, and that winter we saved between eight and ten thousand dollars in hay just because we were able to graze our cattle. Uh, now we got to switch the microphone. What did you do with the dumb calves? The question is, what did we do with the dumb calves? I mean, what what are you talking about? Did they not go around the gate? Did they take it down? You know, you come out there and pretty soon you got cattle all over because the calves went through. I guess uh, th on the dumb calves, it, it ended up being a situation where usually they would end up knocking down, like if, if mama's over here in the next paddock, the calf wouldn't go around the fence, it would go through it. And so there was a couple times where my poly braid would be scattered over the entire cell, which was the most annoying thing that happened. Usually they didn't break out the sides and actually be out, but they just made a made a headache for me moving them the next time was usually what ended up happening and after they got to a certain about two months old two and a half months old and had been through the situation enough times they got a lot better at going around the gate but a lot of times they just went through it drug stuff around so and uh, some of the benefits that we saw uh, from the cow side of things is we had an increased harvest, harvest efficiency um, in those cattle because of how they were uh, grazing at the high stock densities. Um, a lot of this was due to the competition that they had. They were no longer uh, incredibly selective. They would go into a new cell and they would start eating because if they didn't eat it, their neighbor might get it. And well, you know, you got to keep up with the Joneses, so you can't let your neighbor have it. So. Um, that, that was one of the things that came to be. They were very, it was very quick and easy to check the cows, uh, especially with moving them around a gate. I could position myself when that, uh, it, whether there was a bat latch there or not, and I could have every cow walk past me into the new cell, and I, it was very easy for me to tell if anything was wrong, I knew it instantly, um, just because I, I was right there. Uh, there was some very interesting things that came about with the fly control side of things. Because all the manure was uh, concentrated in, an, in a particular area, that manure would also dry out at that exact same amount of time. So there was never fresh manure. So we would have one spike in, in flies, but then the, um, the manure would dry out so the next generation of flies uh, couldn't hatch. They would lay their eggs, but the eggs would dry out in the manure paddy. 
So once we got through that first spike in flies and then, then they die off in their 28 day cycle, we were doing pretty good on that. It did make, uh, it did make the fly component on the cows go down. Uh, we did have a lot of, um, a lot of birds uh, around our mob and when we'd move them into a new cell, the birds would just come swooping down and follow the cows. I'm assuming they were going after any bugs that might have been in that new area, but they were just, they followed all over the place. Uh, we had a bunch of cowbirds um, that followed us around uh, one summer and they'd, they'd be walking around on the cow's back and I can only assume that they were some natural, uh, natural pest control. Um, so another benefit that we hadn't really thought that was going to happen but was a positive at the end. Um, some of our conclusions with the grant and I'm going to kind of try and go through these pretty quick but we had wrote into our grant we wanted to graze 300 acres or more per year. Uh, we realized that it shouldn't be an acreage goal. It should be a tool used on certain areas that need that type of management. That was one of the first things we had uh, realized. Um, we're going to continue mob grazing, but we're going to continue. We're going to use it more as a prescription treatment rather than a, a, a goal of a number of acres to cover. Uh, we'd tell other people to move into mob grazing slowly. Uh, take a take some time to learn from others um, before you start it. It might save you some of the headaches uh, um, of trying to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Uh, the, the mob grazing, it took a lot of time. Uh, it was nice though that we were able to, it made us watch and learn from our cattle. Um, it's important to make cells the right size so that you can get the trample to graze ratio you're looking for. Um, don't expect this to come immediately. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and, and lastly, mob grazing can or cannot work. It all depends how it's used as a tool. Uh, we did, um, we wanted to get some hard data for comparisons over a conventional grazing system, but uh, we think there needs to be a little more data collected to draw any conclusive results. And that is also tied to the, to the um, climate that we had those two years with them being so different. Uh, we did take cattle weights, uh, soil samples, production samples, and 10-point frame readings. Uh, we weighed cattle, um, and then we, we also determined that these things that we had found were relatively inconclusive, inconclusive on our two-year uh, grant project. Um, some of this was also connected to that we would move the cattle in a mob for a week, and then something would come about in our lives where we had to take a week and move them into a cell where they weren't moved as a mob. So we couldn't tie any of the cattle weights to exactly just that we were mob grazing. Uh, grass production samples were pretty much the same, but once again, going back to the weather, uh, that played a difference in, in what things were doing with an incredibly uh, high moisture year with the next one being followed with a very low moisture year. Uh, the goals of getting our bare ground covered was achieved and a goal of lengthening our grazing system, which were the two main things that we saw on this particular ranch, is we needed to get our bare ground covered and extend our grazing season, and both of them were accomplished. Uh, but I just want to come back and reiterate again that uh, mob grazing should probably be used as a tool in your toolbox and not as a whole ranch grazing system. At least that's what we came to the conclusion. And then the rest that we were able to incorporate into our grazing system was really what made things work well. We, we were of the conclusion that um, on our particular land and topography that it just, there were certain areas that for us, the amount of labor output didn't correspond to the increases in production. Um, that's why we'd like to say it, it should be used more as a, as a tool. We're still going to use it as that particular tool. Oh, okay, the areas that we are not uh, going to continue mob grazing, they'll go into a, a more um, tight rotation where we're probably moving the animals anywhere from a daily to once a week is kind of what our standard is. The question is, what's the topography that we wouldn't use for mob grazing? And uh, I would say that comes back to kind of the production side of things. Uh, more of our thin hilltops were, uh, there wasn't enough forage there to trample. Uh, one thing we did see was that we did have hoof impact on those areas and we did see some new plants coming about. Uh, once again, like Krista said, we aren't sure if that was due to the mob grazing or if it was just due to the rest. We also don't mob graze 
um, are really wet areas. We completely avoid mob grazing though. It's just because we know it'll do more damage than good. So, you know, where are we now? What are we going to do? Um, so we still want to improve the rangeland. We still want to have healthy plants that are nutrient dense and deep roots. We want to continue to improve our water cycle and build drought resistance. We would like to increase our production so we could graze more cattle someday. Uh, continue feeding the soil biology and keeping that ground covered. Because we know that soil is really important. If it's healthy, we're going to have healthy plants, and we're going to have healthy animals, and we're going to make more money. And right now, our grazing system, at any given time, 50% of the land is rested during the peak plant growth. 6% you can find cattle on it. Then the 94% of it has no livestock, so it's being rested, and we're always changing our season of use. So our grazing system can um, consist of right now getting the cows to the right place um, at the right time for the right reasons, and this involves an intense rotational graze where we have daily moves, or we move every three to six days depending on what our goal is for that ground. Also, we do winter grazing quality of life grazing so if we know we're going to be gone on a vacation we make sure we have cows in an area where the plants do need a longer grazing um, or it can be in there grazing longer. We already talked about rest and then now we do our mob grazing treatment where we move up to four times a day. So how do we use mob grazing as a tool now? So in 2014 we mob grazed this area and the reason was it was a gravel pit and it's got a lot of wormwood in there and sweet clover and the year before we had planted it to native grasses and we just wanted those little native grasses to not get choked out and we decided that we needed to mow the wormwood and there's just so much forage there was no way that a mower was going to go through this so now I will let Jay finish up I'll just hold it. So with this picture, uh, you can see down in the on the bottom of the screen there that we've got the roller, and you really can't see the string headed over that direction. This is a picture of before we put the cows in there, and then they're going to be on the left side of the screen now. They've been in there for approximately about an hour or so. I was moving them on this particular day. I think I moved them eight times on this uh, on this patch, and then next slide. You can see where they moved into the to the net, to the other side of that uh, picture. They did do a very good job of knocking down most of the um, most of the sweet clover. They did an okay job on knocking down the wormwood. Our goal with this was not to uh, physically eat very much of the forage there. I would say we ate probably 10 to 20 percent of the forage. I wanted to get it down and get that soil surface covered. Uh, here you can see it looks a whole lot different than that picture about five slides ago where you could actually see the rows of the of the seeding and so we got this accomplished uh, and then we came back we still did uh, mow everything so that those uh, new plants those new seedlings could have a competitive advantage um, here's a couple more before and after pictures this was before we went through and while the cows are in there you can see that they are um, they didn't knock down the, the wormwood as well as we'd like on this one. Uh, here I'm standing on top of the spoil pile for the gravel pit and took a picture down. And uh, once again, the same kind of thing. They did knock a lot of forage down. Um, they didn't do as good of a job on the wormwood as I had hoped, but that was okay because we were still planning on coming through and mowing it. So with that, I don't know if we have time for any questions. Um, if you'd, we got time for one. Okay, we got time for a question. If you want to get in contact with us, uh, there's some of our um, contact info. You can look on the North Dakota Grazing Lands Coalition website, and then also on the bottom is our project number for our SARE grant if you want to have all of the uh, stuff that we filed with that. So the question was is on the, when we did the, um, did the gravel pit and we were moving them up to eight times a day, could we have accomplished the same with uh, say three to four times? And I, I think it probably was very minimal, the difference. And I was, to be completely honest, I was playing. I wanted to see what it would happen at really, really high densities. And I don't know if I saw much difference. Especially, especially with the forage that we had there, it was just sweet clover and some Kentucky bluegrass. And we didn't want them eating the little plants. And that's also part of the reason we were moving them so quickly because we didn't want them to camp out in one cell just in case because 
we don't own the land and we want to make sure it looks good. So, so they couldn't back raise? They, they tend to, I guess we didn't explain at all that they were allowed to go back to the water, but um, they always want to go to the fresh grass. So once they, we never made them graze so much that they would go back to the previous cell. Like we always made sure they had really good stuff in front of them so they'd always want to go to the next cell.